of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we had to add two items to the agenda, especially for the bus garage, so they can continue the work in a timely manner. And we want to get the revised school calendar on the record. So, okay, so there were those two items added. So, motion to approve the agenda with those additions. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed. Okay, we have the approval of the NYSIC easement for the bus garage utility work. So moved. Second. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, we have the revised school calendar for 2020 and 21. So moved. Second. Any questions? Yeah, what date is graduation? It looks like July. June 20. Okay, so it's in the middle of Regents then. The Friday right. of Regents. The it's fire. the Friday, the last day. The last day, so you're taking tests on the day of graduation. No, there's never any exams on that day. Okay. It's a rating day. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, reopening. Before I get started, can you see both screens okay? Where, where your seats are? All right. So first I wanna start just by saying thank you for your support um, as we've worked through this. You know that since March 13th, we've been given guidance off and on week to week, um, often with multiple changes throughout the week. So we have worked tirelessly, the team behind you has worked tirelessly over the last three weeks specifically just on this plan, this reopening plan. And it's very important for all of us to remember, first and foremost, that we are in a pandemic. Like that is the first and first thing that we need to consider. Second is that we have mandates and guidelines that we have to follow to reopen. And lastly, we want our kids back in school. So those are the guidelines that we've used to try and make our plan to move forward. Students will always be the center of what we do and you are going to see that over and over throughout our planning process. And our mission right now is for our families and our teachers and our staff to get the best education for their children. So whatever plan is accepted by the state, this is our number one goal. So I'm gonna jump right into the work. We had a reopening task force committee. That committee um, includes all of our union um, leadership it, or, or a person that they chose to sit on the committee as well as all of our admin. We've held weekly meetings to review and share our information and really plan our next steps. We've analyzed the data from the family surveys. It's important for us to gather feedback along this process because it's a new environment for everyone to be in. So I think it's important for you to know what we did in terms of communication with families. For first and foremost, we had two surveys go home to families. The first one asked about traditional, in-person, blended, in-person and virtual, and then virtual feedback. They gave us that 30, I think it was 3,400 people responded to that survey. We also then held 24 Google Meet slash in-person meetings for our staff so that they could provide us feedback on those, um, those plans as well. And really we looked at what did they think worked best in each of those environments what were their concerns in each of those environments? And then what did they need from us to be able to make them happen? So we took all of that feedback and you're gonna see the plan that we came up with tonight. Um, all of that feedback triggered our last survey that went home to families. 
we actually ended up sending that specific survey to families only. So that went out only through building principals and to our direct families. Um, and we had another 12 meetings for our staff to come in and really talk through the models, what were the pros and cons of each. So we re re reviewed those. Ooh. All right. So New York State's guidance categories. These are the 14 areas that New York State says we must meet the guidelines for in order to submit our plan tomorrow. So I'm gonna just talk about each one of them briefly. For us in health and safety, the most important things moving forward are social distancing of six feet, mask wearing, and sanitation. And those three areas kind of led us into moving into our facilities and seeing what kind of educational spaces that we had. So Bill, the head custodians, the building principals, they went into every instructional space in every building and basically took a tape measure or a two by four that was cut six feet long and marked off how many places that we could have our kids in the rooms. And I'm gonna show you some photos of those later. The next category for us was nutrition. We have fed our family since March 13th every single day. Joe Kilmer and his team, Bill and Larry working with transportation and our food service. Um, when school was out, but in from March 13th to June, we fed over 2,000 families a day, about 2,000 meals a day. This summer, it's been around 1,000, um, and Larry's team has transported to door-to-door -to -door for those food services. A change that will be happening at the end of August is that it will go back to that free and reduced form. So families will have to fill out their food form just like they would for a normal school year. And so that will require some changes for families that have received food over the summer um, that were not free and reduced. Also, food is gonna look a little different this fall. It's gonna be individually wrapped food. We're not gonna have those beautiful salad bars that we've had in the past, but our students will get fed and, and that's really what's most important to us. Transportation. This has been the biggest driver um, of our whole process. Meeting the guidelines on a bus is very difficult. Um, Larry and his team have worked every single day to look at every bus route that we have, and they have a really solid plan for us moving forward. Our social emotional needs, they have been met since we left in, in March. Our school counselors, our school social workers, our teachers, they have continued to reach out to families, whether it's been summer or not been summer, and they're gonna to continue to do that in the fall with much more strategic planning. You'll see how each one of these affect our school schedules when we move forward in the presentation. Obviously, all of this has a, bud a budget impact. So you're gonna see some general numbers of the budget when we move forward. Teacher and, and principal evaluations. Last year, they were kind of put on hold. Wherever we stopped, we stopped. That is not an option for us for the um, 2021 school year, so we'll be working on that. Attendance and chronic absenteeism. This will be the biggest change families have to deal with when we come back to school. When we left on March 16th, we basically told families, you need to do what's best for you. You need to make sure that you have food, shelter, child care, if school can be part of that, we'd love you to join our Google Meets. We'd love you to do the work that we send home for you. But there was no you must during that time. This fall, attendance has to be taken every day, whether it is in person or virtual. So that will be a huge cha challenge for families. Another huge, fan, uh, a huge hurdle to to overcome is our technology and connectivity. You know, we know, about 15% of our families do not have adequate internet or internet access at all. 15% doesn't sound a lot like a lot when you say 15%, but 15% for us is 500 kids. So that is something that mm -hmm. we have to correct or we have to be able to help families in some way that are in this situation. 
teaching and learning? I'm not concerned with teaching and learning. We have staff that are amazing. They know what standards our families need to meet. If they're given the time and the opportunity to put something together this summer, they will, and it will meet the needs of our families. Special education needs. We have 900 students in our district who have special education needs. They have to have their IEPs met whether we are in person or not. So Jen and her team have been working tirelessly. The related arts providers have been working tirelessly to try and figure out what's the best way to meet our kids' needs. We also have an ELL population. We have five ELL teachers who cover 25 languages taught, taught or in our district that need some resources. And that's about 60 to 90 kids, depending on what time of year um, we're in. Staffing and human resources. Right now, we don't know what we need. We have to figure that part out, but we have to have a plan for addressing that. And you'll see a little bit of that in the budget today. Career and technical education. We have over 250 kids that attend career technical education at BOCES. BOCES is committed to still offering these opportunities for our kids this fall. So we have to figure out how to get them there and to make sure that they're getting the resources that they need to continue in those programs. And athletics and extracurricular activities. Right now, this is what we know. Sports are not happening until September 21st. That's the earliest date that they can happen. Damien and the coaches are working, the athletic managers are working on what it could look like if we are allowed to reopen and extracurricular activities right now. It depends on space, it depends on the amount of kids, and it depends on the resources that we will have in after school hours for the in-person instruction. All of these categories are covered in the document that's in front of you that's 72 pages worth of narrative for you. And we are um, ready to hit submit tomorrow with our plan. One of the things that we had to figure out was where our admin team stood on reopening, which is the best model for us to come into. So we took a half, of, a half a day at our admin retreat. Actually, Mike was kind enough to use this analysis um, procedure that he's learned about and was trained in, the Kepner Trigo, I always say the name wrong. Um, and we were split Tuesday when we left our team over the AB and the five on, five off. We really were split, split. it was about a, 55, 45 split with our team and really felt we needed to spend a little more time. Why were we there? Why were we there? So Mike took us through this for four hours. We did not move out of that room for four hours and just walk through this. And at the end of the day, these were the things that were most important to us. Safety, continuity of education, as much face-to-face -face personal time that we could get, in-person time that we could get. We wanted to be able to start in September. It's been a long time since we've seen our kids. So we wanted to start with them. Student engagement, adaptability. Can we, whatever plan we have, go in and out? If we have to be virtual, if we can be in person, can we go in and out of these models with ease? We also felt strongly that teacher and student capacity had to be a factor. How much can one family take with going in and out? How much can a teacher really handle and be putting out an effective product for our kids? And how do we maximize and utilize our staff to the best of their abilities? So we came out at the end of that with two plans that we put back out to our com community. So I'm going to go into each category now. So for health and safety, we have to have health checks and we have to have screenings. We want our families to be part of the screening process. Before their kids leave their houses in the morning, they need to help us answer those four questions and help with the temp checks. 
We have over planned for social distancing. Um, there's six feet everywhere you go in our buildings right now mapped out. We have to have a plan for how are you gonna manage the positive cases. Jeff DeLorme and his team, our lead nurse, Ann Stefanini, our district physician, Becky Henderson, they have been working tirelessly to get these protocols in place. And what's appropriate? And actually, that's Anne in the picture. If you guys don't know Anne, that's her in the picture. She's creating video series um, for staff training, for substitute training, for parent training, for student training. So she's making these little clips of videos of, th of processes. How should we and how do we? And then we have to share our proper, how to be properly ready for school when we come, okay? Facilities, this leads us right into facilities. So we have 4,500 kids in our district. And really, if you wanted every single kid to be able to come back, it would have to be additional space. We just don't have the space to be able to do that. So the utilization of space you're going to see in the next pictures. We also have to have a continual cleaning regime. Bill's been working with the custodians since we left in March to start to get into those patterns. And he knows more about HVAC systems now than he's ever wanted to know. Um, and about MERV filters. He's learned a lot about all these things. And signage, There's, there needs to be signage everywhere in every building. So we've worked with companies to have them send us samples of things that we can put up in our buildings. They can be more complicated at the high school level than they can be at the elementary level. So we're trying to balance those out. So here's what our space looks like. So on the left, you're gonna see a high school classroom, how many students we had before in desks. So that's 26 desks in a room. And on the right, socially distanced, that's what it looks like, nine desks, okay? So you're looking at about eight to 10 kids per space in any given classroom. At the middle school, we used a new room and one of our older rooms. And at the elementary level, we used a newer space and one of our older spaces. So you can see what, what is the room gonna look like? One of the guidelines is that all desks must be facing forward. So we have all the desks set up right now, so they're facing the teaching wall. And we know for elementary school, there is no teaching wall. They use all four of their walls. So we have set them up so they're facing the wall that has the smart board or, or TV in it and the dry erase board. So that's the setup in every room. The setup can't change. That's what it has to stay. That's what it needs to look like. So one of the things you're gonna see in our model is how can we teach kids in class and kids at home? So I want you to think about these pictures when I describe what it'll look like in the in-person and virtual model. And if you want, I can come back to these if it helps to visualize that. Nutrition, we talked about. We will provide meals to all of our kids. We're gonna comply with all the operational health and safety guidelines. That picture on the bottom actually shows a picture. Kids will not be able to get their own food in the fall. They're gonna have to either be served or they're gonna have to have the individually wrapped food. Transportation. Here we go. So we have 72 passenger buses and 66 passenger buses. That means we can have between 20 and 26 kids on a bus. So if you think right now, if you remember in the, in the spring, we added a route, we added a bus to a route because there were 50, almost 60 kids on a bus. That was something that we brought to you then. It's almost cutting the busing into thirds, really, to get everyone there meeting the guidelines for health and safety. So what Larry's shooting for, is about a 40% to 50% capacity on those buses. This will drive our entire cohort setup for the fall. It'll be based on where you live. So that A cohort 
will have a certain set of students in it be certain set of students based on where they live. So if you take Irwin Valley, Larry has to cut that school, those routes in half, so that a certain amount come on A days, or Monday, Tuesday days, and a certain amount come on Thursday, Friday days. So it won't be, I wanna to come to school on Monday because that's when where my boyfriend is assigned. It really will be based on where you live. Okay. Another hurdle for families, I'm gonna keep pointing these out. Bus passes aren't an option for us. Those 20 seats, 25 seats, they're going to be assigned to a student who rides from their home to and from school. So that flexibility of being able to choose where you wanna go after school or where you wanna get picked up or I'm gonna go stay with my friend this weekend, it's not an option for our kids. So families are gonna to have to be very consistent with where you pick up and where you drop off. We have special education students who have transportation needs. We're gonna to have to work on those one case at a time. Jen and Larry are doing that already with families and we're making sure that we can meet those. And at the end of the day, we're a little worried about driver shortage. If you did this as a side job to help just have a little extra money, do you want to really continue to do this under the guidelines that there are? Plus the age of some of our drivers matters. They are at risk population for COVID-19. So all things we have to, to consider making our plans. So I just wanna show you what it looks like. Here's a bus. The little red dots are where students would sit on the bus. This is a 72 passenger bus. Next category are social emotional needs of our students. We need to prioritize what things we wanna continue, what services that we can offer for families. And our MTSS, remember that's the multi-tiered system of support committee that we have that runs all year round every month. They're gonna to continue to be our advisory council. So they will help us decide what things do we need to focus on for kids while they're in person and while they're home. We really want to be able to meet the mental health needs of our students, the behavioral needs of our students. This opens up a whole new behavioral realm. How do you behave on camera, you know, when you're in your Google Meets? So lots for us to work on. Okay school schedules and how we drive this. So we're gonna meet the requirements. In-person is in-person. When, when we're told we can come back five days a week with no other guidelines around it, we know how to do that. We're ready for that and we can go in and out of that. Our off-site instruction model, we're trying to change the term to off-site off instruction because we don't want families to think that it's an option to attend school like it was in the spring. So it's really important that we, we need them to understand that between eight and three, instruction is instruction, whatever model we choose. And then our hybrid model will be some in-person and some off-site. You'll see all the guidance really requests that you're planning for a virtual model. So that's what we have to get good at. We have to get good at the virtual part and we have to view the in-person as bonus right now. That's just bonus time for our kids. So this was the feedback from our teachers and staff and from our families. The end of the day, the AB model was really the way our family and our community went. So what does this mean? It means that students will be in class two days a week and they'll be home three. The difference is in that model, you'll see that you're gonna be, you're gonna see them for two times and then you're not gonna see them for five. 
but each week you will get to see your kids. In the other model, there was a large break of almost nine days in between. Um, and it was clear that our families went with frequency and over amount of in-person time. So let's get into these models. 100% off-site instruction. So our families are gonna have two options. You can choose to be completely virtual. You can choose to be off-site instructed. But families who are committing to this are committing to a couple things. One, they're committing that they have adequate access every day for class instruction. The other thing they're committing to is that their family structure allows for their student to be present during their block of instructional time. So it isn't that when you decide to be virtual that you can do the work in the evening or on the weekend. It is your family's commitment that if I have a 9 a.m. block of time, I need to be there. If I have a two o'clock time, I have to be there. So you have to follow the schedule of any student, whether in person or not. That's a big lift for families. We're gonna call them group C in the next picture that you're seeing, just so you know that there's always this group that's at home and they're always home every day. This is our blended model. So we have a group A cohort, a group B cohort, and I've kind of talked you through what this is gonna look like. So they're gonna flip flop week to week. Looking at our school district calendar right now, this gets families between 67 and 72 in-person sessions with their teachers across the course of the whole year. People wanna know, what does Wednesday look like? Okay. We're still brainstorming what Wednesday can look like. In front of you on your table, you have three models, one for elementary, one for middle, and one for high school, and what it could potentially look like at each level on Wednesday. Wednesday is the only time throughout the course of a week that students in the A cohort and students in the B cohort would be together. Okay. It's the only day of the week that they would be together. So what does this look like for our special education families? We want all students who are in self-contained classrooms to be able to come as often as possible. So what we're looking at right now is for them to come four times a week instead of two. So they would come Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So still everyone would be off on that Wednesday schedule. Okay. Okay, budget and fiscal. We still have to meet all the requirements and deadlines that are mandated as they are now. There's no wiggle room in those. I'll give you a, just a second to read over some of the things that we'll have to do. Attendance data drives some of what we get financially. We have to think about if there'll be potential further aid reductions. We know that that could possibly happen in November for the first time. We've applied for the CARE Act funds already, so we're waiting to see what we get back from them. The 180 day calendar still matters. Still have to meet those 180 days. We have to think about what will the impact of low attendance mean for our state aid if we don't meet that. And then we're still waiting to hear about the HEALS Act, which is to be determined soon how much money each district will get and really what each state will get. So the next slide, this is really our best guess at the things we know. This doesn't include things we don't know. We've never done this before, so we don't know. Monthly cost for PPE, it's almost $50,000 a month for PPE. You'll also see some other one-time expenses thermal scanners, storage containers, those MERV filters that I mentioned earlier, document cameras, some things that teachers will need for home. Flash drives, 
can we help our students who don't have internet at home by having them leave on that Tuesday or Friday with some work on a flash drive for them to use instead of having them have to drive somewhere to find access. So we're working on that. At the end of the day, the biggest cost of this is going to be training for how to manage this. Our teachers have to have professional development around what a virtual classroom looks like. How do I teach my students at home at the same time I'm teaching my students in person? And then there's a lot of health and safety training that's needed for everyone. Think about if you're a substitute. You need to come in and sub for a teacher. You need to know how to log into Google Classroom. You need to know how to set up your room for the video camera. You have a lot of new requirements for you to even have that job and be able to do that job. Just giving you a different look at what it looks like. So those thermal scanners, that's that safety piece to be able to come in with the temperature check. It's about $90,000 to outfit our schools for that. And this is the exact breakdown of the slides prior to. Okay, okay we talked about attendance and chronic absenteeism. We have to figure out a way to take it when kids are at home. So if you don't have internet access at home, how are you checking in? Is it a phone call? Is it someone calling you? Is it you calling in pressing one if you're uh, attending that day? So lots of things for us to figure out there. We have brainstormed many options for this, and now we need our technical people, Jerry Deeg and Bill Cameron, to figure out how does it actually work for those kids that are at home? Technology, here are some ideas that we have to meet the needs of our families that don't have internet. Hotspots is one, but I will tell you, we tried to use hotspots in the spring. Some of our families don't have even Wi-Fi connection to make a hotspot work. We talked about, should we drive buses to different locations around our, our outside neighborhoods to see if they could connect that way. But really what we're asking them to do then is to get in their car and go sit by our bus. So is that really feasible for families to be able to do? So we may need, we can, if you open a Google Doc while you're still in the building, while you're still near Wi-Fi connection, you can open it and it will still be usable when you're home without access. We can give students the flash drives with work loaded on. There will be some times that paper is the only way that it'll work. Students will need art supplies at home. They'll need manipulatives at home. These things are going to be needed on those days when we're not in, at school. Do we have the perfect answer for this? None of this is perfect. So we're gonna do everything we can to the best of our ability to meet the mandates and be able to get students what they need to be educated. Equitable, right? Teaching and learning. That 350,000 that I put in here is all about this. They need to time to come in, break down their standards. What are the most important standards that our kids need before they move on to the next grade or into our community? Early learning, we have ProAction. We work with ProAction. We have four pre preschool classes um, that work with Carrie in our buildings. We also have one special education preschool that runs in our, in our family or in our building. So ProAction needs to be a very close partner with us as we move forward, as well as all of our child care providers. We work with Family Service Society, we work with Pathways, we work with the YMCA, we work with the Youth Center. All of these groups need to come together with us so that we can make one plan. Special Education Services. Every student must have their IEP goals met. 
It is important for the services that they need to happen as much as they can in person. And that Jen and her team are gonna to continue to collaborate and communicate with the families one-on-one. -on -one. Some families may choose that they don't want their kids to come back to school right now. And that creates, an, creates challenges for related service providers to be able to provide them their services. Teletherapy worked for some since we left in March, but it didn't work for everybody. So she's gonna to continue to keep working on that. Bilingual education, again, our five teachers are trying to do the best they can to get all of our language learners their services. Staffing. We really just need to get creative with the people we have. What can we use them for? What can we do with them? How can we make them the most useful for our kids in the amount of time that we have them at home? And then how can we use them on days when they're not with us, when kids aren't with us? So what can we do to repurpose? Our next steps. We're gonna submit that plan tomorrow. We're gonna wait to hear if it's approved. We're gonna wait to see what the governor says. He's given himself until August 7th to say, yes, go ahead with your plans or no, you're not going back to school. As soon as that happens, we're ready to go. We're ready to bring in our committees. We're ready to bring in our teachers. We're ready as soon as we have the green light to go. We're gonna to continue to share these models with families. I think the next step, the next most important step for us to be able to move forward is almost like a registration form. You're kind of re-signing up for school. Do you wanna be 100% virtual? Do you wanna be in the A, B model? For families to choose that, they need to know more about what those days look like when they're in person and when they're home. So that will be our next communication challenge making sure that all families have the right information to be able to choose. So that's where we're gonna go starting tomorrow. So at this time, I'm gonna ask that my team come up and sit and we'd love to get your questions and we'll have whoever is in charge of that area really respond to you so that you get the most accurate information. trying to get out of it. See that? <laughs> so before you start with your questions, I want to make sure that you know where all of our information is going to be. So this website here, um, corningareaschools.com, there's a reopening page there. It'll have our updated plans on it. It'll have every update we make. Um, we're looking to make re up weekly updates on the plan as more information comes out to us. This presentation will be there as well. Um, any, the registration form will eventually be there. Any information that we have that will be accessible to families will be on this page. Okay. So we'll make sure we keep putting this out to people. So, shoot, what are your questions? So just to be clear, when you fill out this registration form, you pick whichever, and they can't change their mind until when, or is there, a, whatever they're in, they're locked in for the whole school year. So we're looking at a half year commitment. So you are picking one or the other through the end of January. That's a semester change time. It's when regents are there. So it will be a four to five month. It's really like a 90 day commitment out of the 180 days. So you're looking at half a year commitment. 
for children that live in two households with the transportation mode, they have to basically select their primary household mm -hmm. for their cohorting. Larry's been pretty creative about this. Do you want to talk about what you're thinking you might have them do? So um, they may not necessarily have to pick uh, one household, um, but they do have to be consistent um, week to week. So um, they may go, uh, for example, if they were picked up at mom's and dropped off at you know grandma's, we can still do that, but it has to be consistent. It can't be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, going to one location, Tuesday, Thursday, going to another location. Okay. It's definitely gonna present some challenges, thinking about where to go, where to start and where to end your day. Yeah. And it would be something that they'd be able to specify about on the form, you think? Do you have a need? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Christina. Um, so my question would be the AB model. I just wanna make sure I'm thinking it right. So if you are in group A, you go in person Monday, Tuesday, you are virtual Thursday, Friday, second week you're virtual Monday, Tuesday. No. You, you stay in person Monday, Tuesday, every week you go. Yeah, so families okay. are gonna get a consistent locked in week. Okay. If you're in cohort A, no matter what week it is, you're Monday, Tuesday, okay. and cohort B is Thursday, Friday. Okay. So it stays consistent from week to week. Okay. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, yes. Is there a required number, I shouldn't say required, but is there a number of 100% virtual students that you need in order to make this work? Or does everybody have the option? We've to... created it so everyone has the option. And right now, based on the survey results, it's about 25 to 30% are saying that they're gonna be virtual. And for us in our district, that's about a thousand students. Right. I just have a question about um, the streaming from the classroom into the home. I was just wondering, and maybe now is not the right time to bring it up, but mm -hmm. I was just wondering about privacy considerations for students with special needs or students with any behavioral issues that's being broadcast into homes. Um, if there would be any sort of media release or anything mm -hmm. to that effect. So our vision of live streaming will not include any students just in the screen. filming. Okay. It will be, the camera view will really only show their teaching wall. Okay. So it'll show the teacher and the teaching wall. We're actually requesting that no student is ever shown on camera. Great, thank you. Um, we got into a conversation. Mm -hmm. So what if a student has a medical need while they're in person? Or what if a student is having a discipline need while you're in person? It's the teacher's role then to tell the kids that are online, we have to go now and we'll see you soon and end the meeting so that they can deal with the student that is in their space. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, related to the stream, so I, I say we're considering a number of options um, for um, supporting the technology needs of our students. I'm wondering about the, the buildings. Have we considered the bandwidth uh, needed to have all these simultaneous streams coming out mm -hmm. of the buildings um, and any redundancy of that core, the, the, the internet service at the building level. So I think one of the greatest things from the Mike Janowski era were the facilities upgrades. So our buildings do have the most up-to-date bandwidth Wi-Fi service that there are when we created the buildings. So at this time, really, we are used to things being down a little bit sometimes. You know, we, we get emails from Jerry saying they updated a server, so we'll have service back in a couple hours. So we're used to kind of shifting in and out of. 
sure. that so it won't be perfect for our kids who are at home from day to day. But that's, and, and the, yes. the impact of that is obviously much greater now because previously, obviously, with every, all the students in the classroom, the teacher could, you know, for the most part, continue to teach, uh, you know, depending on whatever you know, the availability of those resources. But now, um, in the event of, uh, you know, Wi-Fi failure, internet dropping, something like that, right? You've got half your class that's suddenly not in the class anymore. <laughs> um, so. I'm gonna um, have Paul follow up too. Okay, cool. So we, we started um, several years ago now with a smart school type. Mm -hmm. A piece of that was a redundancy piece. It's really been the last part of our smart school plan, you know, near the, near the end. So actually, we're we're in the process right now of bidding those lines out, and it'll probably come to the board, uh, you know, maybe August, which is isn't quite there, but we are working on that and have been working on it. So I'm Great. hoping to get that built as just fast as we can. Cool. Thank you. I have a oh, sorry. So um oh mine just so loud um. So this is an amazing amount of work that you've done in such a short time to really find, pull this together. And this is a plan that's really geared toward and within the parameters of what the state requires us to give them tomorrow and to put on our website. What it isn't is a comprehensive operational execution of the plan. And we can't actually do that or answer what I would think are hundreds of questions that parents will have. Some of them have already gotten here. And we can't answer those questions until A, we know we're doing the blended plan and B, we know what the registrations of each of the students are. So we do know what the numbers are. Because looking at the survey, 30%, and I think you said that was a thousand students. So 30% of families already said virtual, only virtual. So you would guess that we'll have at least a thousand students that are gonna choose 100% virtual. So we can guess some of that but you don't know because things are changing in the community as well. Businesses are going back to work, childcare is changing. And until we have those numbers, we can't really answer all of those questions right now. Is that true? <laughs> and that's our next, those that's are all our next, next challenge. Yeah. That's, we need to know which students are gonna be in which cohort. We need to know how many that is. And we need to know what they need on their off days, their off-site instruction days. But it appears to be in the plan that although the Monday, Tuesday, when um, Thursday, Friday cohort is pretty solid, um, parents don't understand. I, I mean, for me, I had to think about it visually when I was looking at the classrooms because I'm thinking, okay, my child goes to school on Monday and Tuesday, for, and then we'll be sitting in a classroom with a teacher having a class. On Wednesday, my child is sitting at home virtually, but still at the same attendance class, same period, same class schedule, um, same other students in the class. Oh, though, is it all students? Well, anyway, same students in the class. And then on Thursday and Friday, my student is not at school at all. And I have other plans that I have to make. But I think too that I was also thinking, so if I have a child that I've chosen 100% virtual for, but I have a child who's gonna go in person, they could be in the same class if I have twins. <laughs> and, but their one child is, I'm getting a little confused here. One child who is virtual is physically sitting at home watching a teacher like you're standing at the podium, do the instruction, the curriculum is the same that day for the same for the students who are in person sitting in the class. So even if they're virtual, they're still kind of with their classroom and their every day is the same curriculum for each student. And then what happens Thursday, Friday, we teach the same things as we taught Monday and Tuesday. So we really need to work with um, each level to see what that looks like for Thursday, Friday. There's been a lot of discussion around what it could look like. And the focus needs to be on that ELA and math block. What will those scheduled times be for students to tune in when they're at home for instruction? 
and then exactly what will it look like? We're gonna have to really back it down to the essential standards. What are the most important things a kid needs to be able to learn um, for them to get ready for the next year? So a lot of our professional development work with teachers will be looking at the essential standards and then mapping that out with the course of each week through the year. And at the secondary level, um, it will look, it will, curriculum's going to keep going and we'll really have to pick. We know that we have the gift of students in our presence two days a week, at least as long as we're, we're able to continue functioning in an open setting. So we have to pick what are the right activities that need to be done while we have our students there. That's really our, our opportunity for hands-on work, keeping things moving. And we've got other students who you're going to, you know, you're going to have them keep thinking about it, keep working on it. Maybe if you did your lab on Monday and Tuesday, you may be doing some further processing of what that looks like and writing on it. So the experience might look a little different for them, but they're going to continue learning together. That's their time to hear directly from their teacher four days a week, two in person, five days a week, two in person with the small group. And then Wednesday, where we're all together. And then the other days we join the small. So it'll, it'll just keep going. I think a big thing um, we've talked about as well is incorporation of the special areas and how we'll make that work on the AB schedule. Um, that'll be an important piece. It's a huge piece of what we do as a district. It's um, definitely one of our keystones. So how will art, music, PE, library fit into that AB schedule? The principals have already started talking about that and mapping it out. So that's one of our huge next steps as well. How will we... Um, integrate the related arts into both the in-person and off-site learning. Jen, can you talk about what special ed services could look like on those days as well? Well, the goal is um, students with special needs to get as much in-person service um, as possible. So it's going to take looking at each individual IEP and the amount of time that students have related services um, or pull out special education. You heard Michelle say for our special class students, the students that are in a special class with maybe a ratio of 812 or our 12131 um, classroom setting, the goal is to try to get those students to school at least you know, four days a week. Um, we have some families though that are already choosing virtual. And so now it's gonna that's gonna you know be a challenge of figuring out you know how to balance virtual needs and the in-person needs. That's why we were kind of thinking of that Wednesday needs to be that day for them to also engage in virtual ways. So whether that's the teletherapies or um, other virtual experiences, because as you heard Michelle say, we may have to move in and out of that fluid and in-person model, depending on action rates and what happens in the area. So we can't just not be exposing students to you know, with disabilities to those virtual options as well. There's a lot to consider. Those that receive consultant teacher services, um, resource rooms, you know, they need to have those experiences with their general education peers, as well as our integrated co-taught classes. Um, the primary role of a special education teacher and their related service providers is focus of the IEP goals and objectives. So the teachers, that's, that's what they have to do. They have to make sure that kids are getting instruction for their IEP goals. They have to progress monitor the IEP goals. Um, and we've had some great success. Um, we have you know close to 100 students right now participating in ESY and getting their extended school year services through teletherapy. We've moved this summer to preparing learning kits. So every two weeks, there's been a distribution where more hands-on materials have been provided for students to, um, to engage in more active ways and less paper pencil. So I think our teachers are already thinking about what could these learning kits look like for the school year um, and you know, committed to giving um, the students the materials they need to be able to engage fully, whether they're in school or at home. So if a student has a one-on-one -on -one aid, but they choose virtual, would that aid then go to the child's house? We cannot provide home-based services at this time. Um, we would probably utilize that one-to-one -one aid to help the students participate virtually. Um, but you pose a great question. There's lots of creative thinking and ways that we think we can utilize, you know, the staff that we have assigned. Um, 
think there's going to be a lot of creativity there and how we have those additional supports to support kids, whether they're in school or from home. My, my other question is, is, is there any thought on providing, we wouldn't call it professional development, but some sort of uh, communication with parents as to how they can best support their child in whichever you know, model they go to? We, we've actually talked about how do we get parents to come in so that we can train them, yeah. give them some professional development around what just some structures could look like or what things that they could do to help them stay organized. I mean, a lot of what we know when we're teaching kids is how do you manage your time? How do you keep your yourself and your things in order so that you can move from place to place? So we're looking at offering those opportunities to our families. That would be really helpful, especially if they have to work from home and, and still manage all of the, the different schedules. I have a question about the nutrition part uh, for elementary level. Uh, you've talked about, um, you know, lunch is instead of like uh, this, the buffet and all of that stuff um, that's at the middle and the high school level, it'll be packaged. Um, will, at the elementary level, will it be in the classroom or are you planning to have the cafeteria, the kids go to the cafeteria still? So it's, that's a great question. And it's based on what Victoria just mentioned. Okay. It is how many kids are we going to have in that A group and okay. B group? So if we know that the number fits, we want to use the cafeteria space for kids. So they are getting an opportunity to move, okay. um, to be with a different set of, not a different set of cohort, but a larger group of kids at one time, but still socially distanced in the room. There might be protocols where you enter one door and you must leave another door. You know, we're working on all of those types mm -hmm. of things, but it really is all driven by how many are going to be there? Okay. So that goes back to that registration form just being really, really important for us to move forward. Okay. And I have one other question, and this is, and now that we live in a world where anything's on the table, if we have a student who chooses to be off-site 100 percent, but yet is an athlete, will that student be allowed to participate? in sports and extracurricular. I mean, it is a possibility. I don't, why, I don't know, but I'm just curious. If and when we have athletics, mm -hmm. um, that's an enrollment choice that they're making that we're offering. So they are able to attend any so, of our programs regardless okay. of which, which choice they make for okay. their instruction. Like I said, it's a- It could anything, happen. It could yes, happen. Absolutely. We have students that as, attend STEM now who still come back and are part of our extracurricular okay. activities. Michelle, I'm assuming there will, won't be any out of building field trips. Right but now, they're not thought about allowed. doing virtual field trips. I know a lot of the museums are dying to do them. Um, they just need the okay to go ahead and start putting their plans. So we are going to have an extracurricular committee and Damien is actually going to lead that group. And so those are the types of experiences that we're aiming toward right now. Michelle, I just had a clarifying mm -hmm. question. Um, did you say that if the student doesn't engage within the school hours, um, is, are there other opportunities for them to engage and be counted present for that day, like in an asynchronous model? It's our understanding right now that synchronous is what we're working toward. Okay. The eight to three time frame for kids. Okay. There will be video though, you know, like we're not taping classrooms. So, you know, that's a good thing for families to know. We aren't taping instruction, but if a student, if a teacher decided to create their own video that they wanted kids to watch on those days that they were off, then they would be able to do that. So those kinds of experiences would be recorded and could be watched at any time. Um, but the actual live instruction portion will not be recorded or available at other times. So as far as like being absent for the day, if they weren't engaged during those hours, then they potentially could, would, could or would be marked absent that yes. day. Okay. So, huh. Starting from March 15th through the end of the year, clearly we did the best we could. 
and we have a substantial population of students who have clearly fallen behind, at least on the schedule that we would like to see them in terms of achieving educational standards. So now we're going to have a system which involves dual processing, okay? And it's going to experience some of the same problems that we experienced before. So what is the prognosis that at the end of next January, we're very close to where most of the students would have been had they had the normal experience in the past? Or are we going to have a population now that is even further behind? So I believe that our teachers work around what standards each kid has to have. There are, if you look at a curriculum now given to us by New York State, there are hundreds of standards that kids are supposed to meet. It really has to come down to what are the core pieces of information that kids need to be able to move on to the next level. I know Carrie had plans um, really this summer to have K and one teachers meet together. What skills didn't you get to in kindergarten that we should start with at the beginning of first grade? So it's those continual conversations between grade levels and between content areas to determine what are the things that we have to make sure are core for every kid to move on. Are we going to meet every single standard that are in New York State? We, are, we aren't. Um, and we weren't really before March. So it's really about those essential standards and moving forward. Do I think that kids are gonna not have the same experiences? They can't, they're only gonna be there two days a week. And this isn't an environment that any of us wanna be in. So we're gonna do the best that we can for each kid. I guess when you look across all of the world and all of the United States, the kids are gonna be in a similar spot regardless of what content they get. Will it be a, what it was when we were in person every day? It's not going to be, it's not going to be. But it is going to be meeting the standards that kids need at the core of every subject area. That's one of the commitments I think we're all making to our kids and our families. And how will we enforce attendance, whether it's online or in school? But if we have this chronic absenteeism, what is the process by which we deal with it? So the processes that we have now are the processes that we have to continue to use. I think it's going to be a lot more one-to-one -one time with families and phone calls, whether it's through school counselors, whether it's through our attendance secretaries. We had the chronic absentee problem before March and we've just seen it exasperated a little bit this spring, and we're gonna to continue to work at connecting. That's the only thing that we can do, is to continue to reach out and connect. And at the end of all of those connections, the worst part that we will have to do is you, at the end, have to contact CPS for educational neglect, and that's a horrible position for us to be in and for our families to be in at the end of the day. So effectively in four weeks, we're going to introduce a system just like that, it didn't exist before. And that's going to be our educational process through January. Okay. What if it turns out it isn't working? I'm in the middle of October and we discover, you know, we're really not achieving what we want to be. What happens? What's plan B? Is there a plan B or are we just suck it up and make it work? Well, the governor and the New York State Department of Ed are going to tell us if we can be virtual, blended, or in person. No, but and we're going to react after the decision is made and we're proceeding, and we discover as we implement these programs, it isn't really delivering what we want it to do. What are we going to do? Are we allowed to change it, or we look at it analytically and change our practice? To, what are we going to do? I think what are you going to yeah, do? This I think what we system. do now is we always regroup when something's not working and we have to regroup if something's not working. We still have to stay within the guidelines provided to us, but we 
if we are in a content area and something's mm -hmm. not working, we stop and our teachers regroup and we come up with a new plan. And that's really all we can do. We're this whole time since March, we have just been in a reactionary state where we have to react to what's coming at us at the time. Bill hates it now when we say it, but we say we have to pivot. No, get, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, you get, you get a set of guidelines and three days later, there's an updated FAQ. You have to pivot. We got guidance today on shields, um, the safety plexiglass, and what's the difference between polycarbonate and plexiglass. That came today. It was different guidance yesterday. Um, so we're reacting and we're changing, and that's, that's really, at the end of the day, all we can do is react and change and try something new. Now, one of the other options for parents, obviously, is to do home teaching. Perhaps you might explain exactly what that process involves, since it's not us, but it's a BOCES program. Sure. Okay. So the other option for families, it's not an option we can offer, but another option for families is something called homeschooling. And that's really when families choose that they're going to educate their students themselves. So they cannot use our resources. They cannot be part of our system of virtual online learning. It is them taking the responsibility to separate from the school district and use their own um, resources. They get connected with BOCES and they are um, required to turn in an individual schooling plan four times a year to BOCES. If they meet the criteria that is in the parent handbook from New York State for homeschooling, then they continue to show progress and they continue to move forward. We do know some families are choosing that right now. And we understand how hard of a decision that must be to, to make. Right now, consistently, we usually have over 200 families that choose that option anyway in our district. And there is a strong homeschooling network out there of parents that get together and do some things. Um, we understand that families might make that option, but it is not something that they can do with us. It's something they're choosing to do without us. So of all of these areas that we are dealing with, what seems to be perhaps the one or two most How to exactly describe this, but what's the most dangerous in terms of results? What is going to have the greatest impact on the results of this educational system? Of all of these things, what are the two most important things that really we have to keep in mind at all times? Or are they all equal? They're all mandated. the end of the day, the most important thing for us is to have our kids in school every day so that they're getting the instruction that they need and the supports that they need, whether they're educational or social emotional, they need to be with us every day. So that's the most dangerous thing. Not being with us is the most dangerous thing. In this environment, there are lots of things that are gonna cause families to have to make choices that they don't wanna make. Childcare is gonna be a driver for families. Transportation is gonna be a driver for families. Food needs are gonna be a driver for families. And we all understand that we have to make sure we're offering as much as we can for them in the environment we're allowed to have. It all comes down to what we're allowed to have. But that, to me, is the most important thing. We haven't said anything, and I'm sure people who are listening in certainly have the question about what happens if a student or a teacher in the classroom comes down with the COVID virus. What, what is going to happen? All your <laughs> Health and safety, Dr. Wexel. 
Yeah, in the plan we have the protocols for what happens if we have a positive test case in a building. First thing we're gonna do is they're gonna notify me once the school building knows about it. The next thing I'm gonna do within about 30 seconds is call the Steuben County Department of Health. And we're gonna start working collaboratively on how do we respond. There are certain things that we're gonna have to do. One of those is um, that space, probably the entire building is gonna be closed for a minimum uh, of 24 hours before we even begin to clean and disinfect. And then we're gonna go through a thorough and deep cleaning and disinfection of that building. And we're not gonna reopen that building unless we've collaborated with both the Department of Health and our chief school physician. You know, along with that, we're gonna work with the Department of Health on contact tracing, notifying people and following the advice from the Department of Health about do those people need to quarantine or not? And what do they need to do based on the guidance from that agency? So that's kind of a short summary of what we're gonna do. And it's all about partnership with the Department of Health. I also have to notify the State Department of Health as well. And again, we're gonna take our lead from those authorities. And in addition to what we already, you know, we've had a, a response plan really since February, if not before. I mean, Bill's got a, he knows what his crew is gonna need to do in terms of cleaning and disinfecting. And then all these other things, we've had those in place. We had to have them in place when we brought back um, our clerical and custodial staff in June. So we, we're, we know what we, you know, what we have to do. We're hopeful that we don't have to. That's why we're gonna be tight on everything, <laughs> you know. And that's why we have a huge education and training program. Um, and you see that reflected in the staff development, but it's also gonna be how do we train students? How do we educate families? All of that. And there are specific conditions which if they occur could result in the entire school having to be closed, right? Or not. I think, are you talking about infection rate? Yes. Yeah, you have to monitor your, inf obviously, we're gonna close a building if we have a positive case. Our, if you're talking about a more long-term, that's gonna be more of a community. It, it ultimately is the superintendent's decision to close a school because that still is within our authority, but we are going to take our lead from the Department of Health and work in consultation with the county and even the state. And if the infection rate's too great in the community, obviously the executive, the state executive can make that call as well, because he certainly reserves that authority to himself. And at this point, there is no resolution to the thought of liability for a school in terms of children acquiring the virus within the school environment. They have not enacted any at either the state or federal level, but I think when you get into the whole issue of liability, the one thing you need to do is you need to be following the guidance from state and federal authorities, and you need to be doing it consistently. We've been doing that since January, and we're gonna to continue to do that. So essentially prevent negligence. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It clear, you know, clear expectations, clear protocols, and consistently done. So are you all confident we are going to do this? And we're going to do it the right way and the best way, and we're going to have minimum problems. In is health what, and is safety, that what you're feeling right now? In health and safety, I'm very, yeah, we've been doing it. And I'm confident we will continue to do it. Well, if you're confident. Mm -hmm. You asked. <laughs> Thank you. I was gonna make a comment about transportation. Hi there. <laughs> so, uh, I've always had an appreciation for the fact that on any given school day, we drive the equivalent miles on our buses of driving from here to Disney World and back every single day. I don't think I had a true appreciation of the 234 square mile school district until I saw our senior signs and yards this year. Driving out 414 towards Watkins Glen, I, 
I, I had that concept that we had students from Beaver Dams. I went there for some of the facilities presentations, but I didn't until I saw a student's sign in a yard, which I beeped at every time I went by. <laughs> um, actually, how far out some of our students physically are in terms of transportation to come in. I mean, they were, I'm like, geez, you know, a couple more miles, I'm at the ice cream stand in Watkins. So it really gave me a different concept in, in, in Lawrenceville and almost in Lawrenceville, which is Pennsylvania. Um, and so in terms of breaking up your transportation and determining the cohorts for that, uh, I think that's one great huge project you have. And then dividing that up based on what the registration choices are for the students per family, which could be the same in a family or different in a family based on their choices. Um, that's pretty monumental. So. Um, it is. Um, and I'm pretty proud to say that we're, um, you know, we're probably 98% done of dividing those bus runs into different cohorts or families in the, or families. Um, and we've just run across so many different um, challenges uh, because one, because of the size of our school district and, and the diversity and, um, you know, uh, so, you know, one example was, you know, a family that may live in the Greg school area. Um, well, they may be a walker to Greg. Um, they may have a high school student who is a walker to the high school, but then they also may have a middle school student who is bused to the middle school. So in trying to keep those families on, the, on an A day, um, that whole entire family on an A day, that was a challenge um, because we had to look at the bus run being an A day student or, or B day student. And then we also had to look, okay, does, is that student gonna fit into the Walker uh, a, a group at Greg Elementary and then also at, at the high school. So it, there was a lot of challenges that we didn't foresee in it's almost impossible to foresee, but that's that's what we've tried to accomplish in, in the last few days. And then we await the governor's decision. Yeah. This is um, this is obviously not a plan that you want to be that that should be put together in isolation. And I want to thank you for for not doing that. <laughs> you definitely have you know, been very open with your planning process and including um, community member community input on a regular basis in the planning process, including parent representatives directly in the planning process. So thank you very much <laughs> uh, for doing that, for involving the community in that. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about um, some of the other I mean, community partnership work maybe you're working on or planning on working on um, in order to help support um, children and families with all the, the scheduling. So one of the um, committees that we started with last Thursday night is a parent advisory task force. So there are about 34 parents on that advisory task force. They are representative of all building PTAs. So the PTA um, representatives either chose people from their buildings to be part of it or them they themselves are on the committee. Um, they were able to see the AB and the five on five off model so that they could help um, with messaging around what are the differences between these two models. We also have a 21 student, pan, uh, student advisory panel and they are from grades five through grades 12 and they're about 50 50. Um, split with high school and then middle school and, ele and elementary. It was mm. quite amazing to hear the fifth graders responses to what didn't work for them in the fall and what they really wanted us to try to preserve for um, the next year. Uh, it's interesting how much they see and know, you know, uh, and they didn't like not being connected with people. They wished that they could be more with their colleagues or their peers and more with their teachers. Um, one of the fifth graders specifically said, it was great to see my teacher on some Google Meets, but there are other teachers in the building that I missed too, and I didn't get to see them. 
so that was a driver for why we said, oh, we, we need these kids in at some point so they aren't just seeing their one classroom teacher, but they're also seeing other staff that are there. Another um, student mentioned that her favorite person in the building is, was the cafeteria monitor and she hasn't seen her since March. Um, one of the things they wanted us to preserve, uh, again, one of the fifth graders said, sometimes school can be really stressful and my special is what helps me relax a little bit during the day and be able to complete my work. A high school kid said, we have the coolest things. We have so many electives. We have so many clubs. We have all of these interactions throughout the day. Is there a way you can preserve some of that no matter what model we are when we go into the fall? So those are the things that we're trying to take. Um, we're all, I'm also sitting with a group of nonprofit agencies. Um, like I said, we have family service providers and pathways sit on the parent advisory committee. So we're constantly talking with child care providers. Larry's reached out to all of the large child care providers in our area to see what they need and how we can work together to help with child care. Thank you. Yeah. I just have a quick question, Michelle. So, um, I mean, I think this is serious heavy lifting that has happened in a very short period of time. And I know nothing can be perfect. Um, and this is everything but the kitchen sink is, pro is in here. But is there something that you think that you wish could have been in here, but maybe just you couldn't fit it in because of the mandates or the guidelines, but you wish, is there something that so I think that's gonna ch that document that you have is gonna change every week okay. because more and more details as we work them out, we wanna add in there so that there's always an updated guide for families. We also want to make some shorter, quicker pieces of information and communication. So if you're worried about transportation, there's a place you can go just for that. So we're looking at building communication. So it's not that there's something we missed or felt we wanted to it's more right. that the more we as you confirm, grow you're going to we're going to grow that form okay yes. great we're going to grow you. that document you know during our retreat jen kept saying that we need to be confident and committed and i think that that's really the most important thing that um this is the best of the worst um, Mike said in a video to kids, we need to embrace the suck. And that's really <laughs> what we're trying to do is embrace the suck. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, <laughs> and that we are, when we talk to teachers, we say, this is not ideal to our families. We say, this is not ideal. This is the best of the worst. We're committed, committed to making it the best of the worst and we need your support and your confidence in the work that this team is doing and that the building admin are doing. You know, I asked Robin and Kate and Mike to come tonight because at their levels, they are working tirelessly. When I said to them in all the meetings, related arts has to still happen, they went to work. They're trying to make it work so that kids can still have those, those pieces. Everyone here is just working nonstop. We have two interns right now. I hope that they want to stay in administration after that. <laughs> you know, after this, it's definitely trial by fire. But at the end of the day, some of the things we can't fix. I can't put internet in everyone's home. It's just not something we can do. So our biggest challenge is how can we make that experience educational experience for those kids the best that it can be we can't fix it but we can try to do some things to help make it better than what it was in the spring so i need your confidence and your commitment to stay in this with us yeah i don't have a question it's more of a comment i've been thinking a lot about how you know this particular moment in history and this challenge is before us really is an opportunity for us to innovate a little bit or at least break new barriers around 
how we do team up as community institutions, educational institutions, and families to provide the best possible experience that we can for children because we have to. We didn't have to before, you know, and I think so for my part, like a commitment I would make is to kind of champion that idea that we're, you know, that we're in, in this together and if we're all in, maybe there's going to be something incredibly positive that comes out of it that we wanted to be doing better before, but that now we have to do it. So it's a chance for us to, to really learn and grow. I'm glad that Marge brought that up because clearly these are the times that provide you with very unusual opportunities. And certainly there are three areas here that we can learn from and move forward in the future. One is the technology part. That is how do we integrate technology now into the educational system? This is our first serious dip now into using that as a tool for the educational <laughs> process. You've constantly talked about partnership with parents and getting parents involved in the educational process. I think so far, well, just if you look at the thousands of responses just on a survey, clearly we have made some impact there because they feel they're participating in the process. So I think that provides us now with even a better foundation to reach out in the future and involve parents in this total educational process again. So, and the other part is communication always talk about that. What is sort of the biggest area that we can always improve in is communication. So here we are forced now to really communicate with all of our stakeholders on very important matters. And so far, I think we have been more than reasonably successful here. So there's the three key areas we've talked about many times before. Now we have the opportunity to make serious advances in all of those. So we will continue to take the learnings from these experiences over the next one or two years and expand them both to our benefit here. And I'm glad you pointed out right at the beginning now and sort of at your, your final con statement there was that our job is to provide the best educational experience. No matter what the circumstances are, that is our job. And we all do the best that we can in terms of the resources that are available and whatever other limitations are set upon us. None of us would choose any one of these things if we were simply free to do it. We had all the resources in the world and everything else, but we are doing the best that we can. I think most people appreciate the fact that what we're doing is going to be the best in terms of what is available at the moment. But I'm last reminded, but 1940, Winston Churchill made a speech in Parliament, and that was just at the point where World War I had started, World War II had started, excuse me, and it was pretty clear that Germany was going to start to bomb the whole of Britain, and especially London and everything else, okay? And certainly most of the people in Britain didn't have much confidence in what was going to happen in the future for them. Great fear, anxiety, and every, everything else that's associated with a war. So he told the parliament, at the same time speaking to the British people, that 10 or 20 years from now, people will have appreciated all of the things that are happening now that the people are going to do. They're going to fight the Germans on the shore and everywhere else. They're just going to fight back and they're going to win this war. And he finished that by saying, because 20 years from now, people will look at today and say, this is their finest hour. And this will be one of our finest hours. Thank you. Anything that, else? That is confidence. Yeah. <laughs> Are we done? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Thank you.